I'm Rob Graham from Aratus Security. Uh, today I'm going to talk about data seepage. Data seepage is an issue that many people know about who use packet sniffers, but it hasn't really reached to uh, a level that people are actually talking about the problem and its solutions. The problem of data seepage is that our laptops and computers disclose a lot of information about ourselves that we're not quite aware of. For example, when you open your laptop, the first thing it does is looks for a wireless access point. And the wireless access points it looks for are ones that you've connected to in the recent past. That means that somebody listening nearby can sniff what access points you're looking for. For example, if you've been to various airports throughout the world, your laptop will likely access those uh, wireless access points at those airports. So if I'm watching the wire or the, the wireless network while you're doing this, I can find out where you've been. For example, let's say that you're a CEO of DoubleClick, which is right now has rumors that they're being acquired by Microsoft. If I'm next to you in an airport lounge and I see that your notebook is trying to connect to an, an access point called Microsoft Internal Access Point, then I would have confidence that maybe those rumors are true. So this information is not stuff that you're trying to keep secret. It's stuff actually that your machine broadcasts to the rest of the world because your machine is trying to actually do something useful and interesting and not have to have you type in your, your information yet again. Uh, that's just one example. There's a whole list, long list of information that your machine discloses to the rest of the world. For example, iTunes is a very easy to use program that among, among many things uh, will allow other people to listen to your music. So when you open your laptop computer, it discloses to everyone nearby uh, who you are, what, what music you like to listen to, and uh, makes that whole list available to everybody else. So for example, I can log on to your iTunes server, listen to all your music, download it, watch the videos that you have on your, on your machine, and so forth. A big concern with data seepage is not just the information that you broadcast locally, but the information that you disclose on public websites. For example, many salespeople have an account on ESPN. Uh, this information is uh, published to everybody locally when they connect to ESPN with their account information. So I can find their login name and possibly their password but that they use for ESPN. However, many people use the same information for their corporate or banking accounts. So even though they might not care that a hacker watches the password they use for ESPN, uh, they will care when the hacker then logs onto their bank and takes all their money. So data seepage is information that you don't care about, that you're not trying to keep secret, that you're leaking out to all the hackers, as opposed to data leakage, which is secrets that you don't want to disclose. But yet the seeped information still has hacking consequences. And so that was the focus of our presentation here at Black Hat, where we disclosed that. We also showed a tool called Ferret that anyone can use to run their local laptop computer where they can see all the information that they're seeping out to the rest of the world. Hi, I'm David Maynor. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Rad Security. Uh, the, I, I've been in Black Hat Amsterdam for the last couple of days, and we've been talking about a concept called data seepage, uh, which has been explained very well by my uh, co-presenter. And it's basically a topic in which we look at a lot of different information that a uh, machine will accidentally leak or, or let loose uh, that you may think of benign, but when combined will actually give a, a, a remote viewer uh, a pretty strongly accurate view of uh, a person, uh, an individual, or you know, uh, what type of websites they visit, what types of uh, instant messaging clients they use. And you know, it, it, this kind of information, although at first you know, it appears benign, to a passive remote attacker, this is helping uh, make your attacks more accurate uh, and more robust. Uh, knowing what type of uh, AV client you use can uh, yield two different possibilities. Uh, it can, if you have a bug in that particular AV client, you can use that as a targeted attack method. Also, if you have a, um, an evasion, basically, for a specific type of AV client that you know they're using, you can butt on exploit that type of evasion. Now, fingerprinting or uh, determining passively what type of uh, AV uh, implementation a laptop or a person is using is pretty easily.
pretty easily done. Basically what you do is you wait until the, the machine boots up and the first thing it's going to do is try to connect and see if it has the latest virus definitions. So for instance, if, it's, if something connects like liveupdate.com, you know they're a McAfee user. Symantec has, oh wait, that's Symantec. Um, McAfee has their own version and even uh, Microsoft has their Windows Update service. So it is uh, useful for a person to be able to determine remotely what type of uh, software you're running and uh, what version it is. Also, when you boot up, uh, a lot of stuff that will happen is um, applications you have out, uh, to set to automatically start will do just that. And also, uh, machines you've connected to before, uh, like via uh, shared drives and things like that, will uh, you'll attempt to reconnect it. All this information gathered passively will give a person a pretty accurate view of the, your internal network. If you think about it, you can get you know a, a mail server, your file server information, uh, and even internal routing information, um, all from just listening passively. And these types of attacks, um, this type of information will make client-side attacks, which is very, very popular. Lately. Client-side attacks are things like, you know, buffer overflows in office documents, and then you'll spam an entire company with it. Uh, these types of attacks won't, uh, this type of information will make attacks like that more, um, more viable. So, you know, we're asked a lot of times, how do you protect yourself against this? And actually, that's a really hard problem because. Machines are designed to share this kind of information. Uh, machines like uh, Microsoft Windows or the Apple OS X operating system are designed to be very chatty. So the problem, one of the best ways to defeat this is to uh, not connect to networks that you don't trust, and not to uh, that way you're not sharing the information. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that we don't have to break any. Uh, basically, we don't have to break into most networks to get this kind of information. Uh, most networks that are unencrypted that don't require web keys or things like that. Um, are you know right for this type of type of attack? So uh, one of the best ways to make sure that you're not a victim to this is just to not do it. If you have to do it, make sure you use a personal firewall or some other type of technology that will limit the amount of um, applications that are allowed to use a network if it's not a trusted network. In addition to that, I highly recommend uh, encrypting everything. Uh, if you can set up an SSH tunnel, that would be great. But that that's outside the realm of uh, most users. If you can do uh, like uh, an S a web-based SSL client or something like that, that would be great as well. Basically, you want to be uh, conscious that everything you're doing is going out over a network and any third-party source can remotely uh, uh, or passively uh, monitor this. You know, and this is uh, especially true for things like instant messaging clients. They're particularly uh, vulnerable to these types of attacks for two reasons. Not only can I see the messages you're sending back and forth because most instant messaging clients don't do it encrypted, they will also send you periodic updates on the status of all of your buddies. So you can actually use this to build a web of uh, who knows who and who is on uh, whose buddy list. Uh, using that, you know, uh, collecting data from a couple of different sources, you can build a pretty large tree of, you know, who a person is and who their friends are. Uh, which, you know, if, if you're trying to find uh, in, uh, ingress points into a corporation, the first place to start looking is people on, you know, your buddy list. Basically, every instant messaging client, like the Yahoo Messenger, the Google Messenger, and even the MSN Messenger, have these same types of behavioral traits. The, the thing to keep in mind is the only real defense against an attack like data seepage is knowledge. Knowledge that basically everything you do over an uh, untrusted, unencrypted access point can be monitored by a third party. I'm David Maynard. Thank you very much.